Welcome to Let's Talk Humanitarian. Parlons humanitaire, enriching conversations with humanitarian workers and humanitarian leaders to open eyes, heart and mind. This is a program by Kalyu Institute, your online center for humanitarian aid studies, where humanitarians train humanitarians. My name is Amelie Yanguifes, and I'm really delighted to host this conversation with Kamal Kishore, member of the National Disaster Management Authority of the Government of India. Hello, good morning, Kamal. Thank you for being here with us. Good morning, good morning. Glad to be here with you talking. Thank you, Kamal. I'm going to introduce you before diving into our topic of disaster management and uh, disaster management in India. You've worked on disaster and climate risk management issues for over 20 years um, at national, regional and global levels. And prior to joining the National Disaster Management Authority in India, you worked with UNDP, the United Nations Development Program, for nearly 13 years in New Delhi, Geneva and New York. You'll tell us after a little more about all that. At the UNDP headquarters, you led the global advocacy campaigns to address disaster risk reduction concerns in the UN Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, and the post-2015 Development Agenda. As a program advisor, you also led the development of disaster and climate risk management related elements of the UNDP strategic plan for 2014 to 2017. Previously, you've been um, in with UNDP, you were the regional advisor for South and Southwest Asia, where you supported more than 10 countries on public policy, institutional development issues. You also advise them on the use of appropriate disaster risk reduction tools and methodologies. You've supported post-disaster recoveries through strategic advice, needs assessment, program development, and coordination after major disasters in Bangladesh, India, Indonesia, Iran, Maldives, Myanmar, Nepal, Pakistan, the Philippines, and also Sri Lanka. You served also Asian Disaster Preparedness Center as Director of Information and Research. This was before UNDP. Um, you were the manager of the Extreme Climate Events Program that was covering Indonesia, the Philippines, and Vietnam. You, and before that, you were with Action Research Unit for Development in India, working on post-disaster reconstruction and resettlement after the two major earthquakes, the Uttarkashi and the Latour earthquakes in 1991 and 1993. So, Kamal... Um, can you tell us what drove you to the um, to work in the disaster field? I understand um, your educational background is uh, I mean you you are an architect, so so yes. so how how did you get um, into the disaster management field? So I think uh, it was a mix of chance and also discovery. Uh, when I was studying architecture in the Indian Institute of Technology, Roorkee. That was in early 90s. In 1991, there was an earthquake in uh, Uttarkashi, which is, uh, you know, uh, seven, eight hours drive in those days in the Himalayas from Rurki. And the earthquake happened just a couple of weeks after I had been trekking there. So after the earthquake, I thought I should do something. And then I started to work with some local organizations on temporary shelters while I was still a student. And soon after that, I finished my degree. Uh, and then there was an NGO looking for architects who could go and live in a village and uh, help rebuild earthquake resistant houses using to the maximum extent possible local materials. So I started working there, and I, I, living and working in a village where we built a small village, uh, 37 families only. And then by the time I finished that, there was another earthquake. This was now in Maharashtra, 1993. So I started working there. So I was essentially mm. applying my architectural skills, learning a little bit of earthquake engineering, to do non-engineered earthquake-resistant houses. But very soon I saw that, you know, risk reduction is not just about buildings, it's also about governance, it's also about 
community involvement. It, there are a whole range of policy issues, program issues, governance issues that underpin safety. So I gradually, I drifted or I evolved from being an architect to a, a disaster risk management with a wider perspective of disaster risk management issues. So interesting. Thank you, Kamal, for for, for sharing this, this journey with us, because I understand uh, also you have been able to develop in terms of policy and, and, and seeing the bigger pictures because you've started in the field. So important not to, to, to really experience the field and know what are the questions that are, that are the most important when we are in the field and when we need to save lives, build back better and um, recover from uh, disasters. So Kamal, you, you, um, we mentioned at the beginning more than 20 years, but it's actually 30 years, uh, almost 30 years of, of experience in the field of the disaster management. Could you tell us what is the um, evolution and that you have observed, the, the big trends um, all along these 30 years? I can say that uh, over the 30 years, the field of disaster risk management has uh, come a really long way. Uh, it has evolved a lot. And let me uh, highlight three key things which basically define uh, this evolution. So when I started working in this field, so for the first one, uh, when I started working in this field, uh, in the, the decade of 90s, it was called, uh, the, there was an international decade, UN International Decade for Natural Disaster Reduction, UNIDNDR, which concluded in 1999 with the, the global event, which was held in Geneva. Now, you would notice that that decade was called International Decade of Natural Disaster Reduction. So one key evolution that has happened is that we have permanently dropped the word natural from disasters. Hmm. Now we recognize that disasters are not natural. Hazards may be natural. An earthquake may be natural. Uh, a cyclone may be natural. But it becomes a disaster because of a whole range of human actions. Uh, an earthquake which happens somewhere in the sea and affects nobody is just a natural hazard. It's not a disaster. It becomes a disaster when there are people living in earthquake-prone areas. And when people living in earthquake-prone areas are living in buildings which are weak buildings, which cannot withstand earthquakes. So living in the earthquake-prone areas and making weak buildings are human actions. So essentially, disasters are all man-made. So I think that's one key change that has happened. It is widely accepted and recognized that something happens in our society, in our social, economic, political, cultural system, which turns a hazard into a disaster. So that's a big realization. And in the same vein, let me just highlight one more thing. Um, the second point, which is that when we looked at the technical advisory committee or scientific and technical committee of the IDNDR, except for one person, if I recall correctly, all of them were from the natural sciences. So they were earthquake experts, they were cyclone experts, they were volcanologists, they were meteorologists. So it was all driven, driven from the natural sciences end. So they were engineers and scientists, except for one or maybe two people at that time. And now it has become a much more broad-based thing where you have a lot of social sciences people, behavioral scientists working in it, governance specialists working in it. Now we realize that it is no longer enough to treat uh, disaster risk management as a narrow physical sciences problem, mm. understanding how earthquakes occur or how, um, how cyclones occur. But why do we live in earthquake prone areas? And we've, if we have to live in earthquake prone areas, why do we make weak buildings? Do we don't have the capacity? Do, do we don't have the governance mechanism to enforce a regulation? So 
once you open that up you know it really has to become a much broader field the third uh, evolution which is relatively recent one can say in the last few years is uh, a movement towards taking a systemic approach uh, we can no longer look at disasters or impact of disasters in an isolated way in one location in one sector and the current pandemic is really highlighting how impacts can ripple across the world ripple across different infrastructure systems uh, not just within a country but across the world we are a more interconnected interdependent world so a systemic approach is really key in a cyclone prone area when um, a power system electricity supply is disrupted it's not just just the electricity supply that is affected if you don't have electricity the telecom system will go down as well because the power backup you know will not last beyond a few hours if the telecom system goes down then your atm machines will not work yeah. if your atm machines don't work then you uh, people don't people who don't who are not even looking for assistance they just want to draw their own cash they won't have access to cash when you don't have cash markets stop functioning manufacturing units stop functioning so so it is really important to take a systemic view so these three changes you know i mean you know dropping the naturalness of so called natural disasters mm. and asserting that they're all man made there are no natural disasters second is much greater play of social sciences and the third is evolution of uh, systemic approaches these are the three big milestones that i have observed over the last three decades well thank you so much um, kamal for this information what do you think because you were in the middle of that i mean in your different roles you were clearly an actor of of this uh, of these milestones what do you think and um, has been instrumental to so that we are able to to reach this result like uh, acknowledging that it's not so natural but it's made by us then um in ensuring that we we have a systemic approach to to disaster management what do you think has been key um policy advocacy uh, legislation well uh, regulations or, or or international documents that uh, push and oblige us to to take action or what do you think has been really important yeah see i think there have been uh, three things that have uh, influenced this uh of course uh, uh, one is that uh, the decade of uh, natural disaster reduction in the 90s uh, followed by the hugo framework faction and now sendai framework uh, these uh, frameworks you know before hugo in 1994 during the decade of natural disaster reduction we had the yokohama strategy so we've had these three important global uh, frameworks yokohama strategy hugo framework and now sendai framework so all of these have definitely helped uh, raise the awareness of uh, disaster issues uh, they have really um, highlighted the importance of these issues uh, for the fundamental well-being of our society our world the humanity and not just something you do as an add on so, so that is one very clear um uh, contribution that has come the second thing that has uh, been there is that uh despite a lot of development in meteorological sciences in earthquake sciences there was a time when it was being observed that despite these advances uh we are not really being able to reduce losses especially economic losses livelihood losses to the extent we had hoped to so obviously something was not really adding up and that came to a realization that maybe we are not looking at the problem in its totality or we, maybe we are just looking at the wrong end of the problem too much yeah. so of course it is important to understand how earthquakes occur where they occur how strong they can be how frequent they can be but it is also important to understand where people live how do they build what governs how they build 
you know why do people live in coastal areas if coast if they live in coastal areas why are they not building uh, not being able to build build wind resistant structures uh, what is the governance system there so i think that realization that you know we have to go beyond um just looking at the engineering or physical science side of the problem uh, to be able to reduce losses that's the second thing the third thing which has happened is really over the last two decades or even more two and a half decades perhaps a much greater emphasis on people's agency uh, on community based approaches to disaster risk management we no longer look at communities as victims we look at them as uh, principal actors of disaster risk mm-hmm. management they have to be in the driving seat they are not subjects of our interventions they are principal actors and if you want to work with communities we have to use what exists at the community level before or after a disaster as the starting point it's people's resources their imagination their initiative that is the most important thing that is the starting point not an external intervention not an external input so i think these three things you know the 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 role of the frameworks our inability to reduce losses despite scientific advancements and much greater focus on community based work uh, people's agency people's voices these have brought about the transformations that i just outlined a few minutes ago hmm thank you thank you very much kamal to 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 highlight um, the importance no actually of uh, of the community being actors um of the um, the recovery of the, the the response and 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 also of the risk reduction and the risk uh, well the risk management as as a whole now you are um, you are working with the um, national disaster management authority so now you're in the government um and you've brought to this government well wealth of uh, experiences and knowledge and, and this global perspective and this systemic you know, approach to disaster management so can you tell us a little about your role and uh, including um your i guess that the, there must be one part very exciting when when you can be in a government and have this direct influence in with um the communities but also at policy level etc and uh, and also challenges um can you tell us what are those so um uh, let me uh, answer that in three parts uh, first i will talk a little bit about uh, my role second uh, uh, you know the opportunities and the third i will talk about challenges uh my role i work for india's apex um authority uh, it's called national disaster management authority it's a uh, lead agency for uh, disaster risk management in the country somewhat similar to fema in the united states uh and as the lead agency uh, it lays down policies plans and guidelines uh, both um horizontally for to be fo- followed by other ministries and departments of the central government but also for emulation or following up by the states and district level of course with a lot of flexibility for the states and districts to cater to their own unique context india is a large country with a very wide range of hazard exposure and vulnerability context so you can't have one size fits for all but overall normative guidance is provided by uh, the ndma we also work uh, quite directly with states on specific issues we have perhaps the world's largest cyclone risk mitigation program and we've been able to reduce losses by several orders of magnitude over the last 15 years or so uh, we have a similar program on landslides earthquakes uh um, but also not just hazard wise program but integrated multi hazard programs as well so that's in brief my role uh, in terms of uh, the excitement or opportunity i think the biggest uh, opportunity uh, while working for the government is to have a really big picture view uh, and to be able to bring together resources capacities of 
multiple sectors uh, together and really sort of craft a new narrative uh, in the policy making as well as in implementation in uh, promoting a um, comprehensive approach to disaster risk management. Let me illustrate that with a couple of examples. So over the last few years, we've worked very closely with the Finance Commission of India, which basically uh, allocates resources uh, from the central revenues to the states, including for disaster risk management. And we've been able to completely uh, revolutionize the way the Finance Commission has, I mean, the credit goes to Finance Commission for revolutionizing, but we've had technical support to it in the way disaster risk management financing works for, uh, for the country, which is essentially characterized by uh, not just allocating money for post-disaster response, but also for prevention, not just for immediate response, but also for uh, recovery and reconstruction, mm. also for capacity building and preparedness. So, you know, that the, the kind of change uh, that can happen as a result of it has huge far-reaching implications. It's not just something which affects us um, over a few years, it's for decades. So I think the opportunity to uh, bring about systemic long-term changes uh, is there um, while working uh, with the government. And uh, all the experience that I've had globally, I've been able to sort of bring that together and uh, direct them to the service of my own country. The second example internationally uh, over the last two, three years, recognizing the systemic nature of risk we've been able to launch under our prime minister's leadership uh, a global coalition for disaster resilient infrastructure as of date we have 22 countries and a variety of countries uh, from all across the, the world uh, and uh, seven international organizations coming together and looking at how we can make infrastructure resilient to the risks not just as they stand now, but also future risks. So, so I think these kinds of uh, ambitious, large-scale things can be done uh, if one puts one's mind to it uh, within the government. I wanted to Go ask ahead. you, what is again the name of this coalition? Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure, CDRI. Okay. Mm -hmm. Excellent, because when so, I was hearing all these um, achievements, um, I thought so interesting indeed what you have um, been able to achieve with the finance part, you know, which is a big topic you know, all, yes. all over. So, so how do yeah. you share that? So what I hear is uh, creating coalition and uh, within ASEAN That's also, right. you, you have some sharing of experiences with the different governments? Yes, with ASEAN, with, uh, with SARC, with BIMSTEC, we've been sharing so... Uh, you know, government to government cooperation bilaterally with a number of countries, our cooperation with Nepal in the context of post earthquake recovery after the 2015 earthquake. So many opportunities like that. Uh, the challenge, uh, the challenge of uh, working in the government system uh, is that as the one can perhaps call the government as preeminent domain or um, a key pillar of governance. Uh, although I must say that all governance is not government. You know, governance is a broader concept, but government is a key pillar of uh, risk governance. So, as somebody working for the government. Uh, whenever they, whatever the kind of hazard, whatever the kind of event across the country, uh, you can never say that it's not your problem. So I think mm -hmm. the sheer magnitude of responsibility, accountability is overwhelming. Whether it is a chemical incident in a coastal town or a forest fire, and uh, so, uh, of course, there are systems at the local level, at the state level for dealing with that. But you still have to uh, play a role in this. So I think that can be sometimes a bit overwhelming. Working for an international agency or an international NGO or 
any such uh, any academic institution you can very tightly define your mandate that this is what i am responsible for and please uh, please ask me questions about this i think it's more difficult within the government to do that if somebody right now calls me and says that i'm calling you from such and such place uh, there's an urban flood here and my um, mother who needs uh, dialysis is stuck there can you help me with that mm-hmm. of course there are local responders uh, on the ground of course there are people in the district in the state but i can't say that you know this is there is it's not my problem yeah. i still have to call and make those connections work and hopefully so so what, the, the challenge is how do you sort of cater to those expectations while also strengthening the overall system of managing this so that's a challenge and i'm sure my peers and colleagues in other countries uh, feel the same challenge yeah in 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 india is was well, it almost a continent by itself no it's uh, how many Indeed. people are you in the national disaster management authority so we are about 130 people in mm. all in the national disaster management authority uh we also have a national disaster response force uh, aligned with uh, the national disaster management authority which is basically a national team of responders that is of course a very large number of people but they are based in different locations in the country there are about 12000 of them and then uh, in addition to that of course we also have state disaster management authorities um so they have capacities and district disaster management authorities so so india is a federal country so the main responsibility for disaster risk management is really of the states so uh, 130 people in uh, delhi may sound small for a large country but in a federal structure if our state authorities are strong i think that is okay hmm thank you for um, for for giving us this this overview of um, opportunities and challenges from the government level because that that uh, helps also in the our audience who are students of our master of humanitarian aid or but who are already uh, working in this field uh, with the united nations maybe with the red cross movement or um, non governmental organization um, to to have this perspective and also when we interact it's important to understand what is the reality of um of the other part um so at this moment in india and nowadays what you, what would you say are the main priorities of ndma so um i mean we are in a pandemic year so obviously uh getting the pandemic under control uh is a big priority uh and there are so many new things uh that we haven't dealt with in the past so it's a constant process of uh, learning uh, of course there's a lot of uh, past experience to draw upon but we haven't seen anything in our lifetimes at this scale uh and while the pandemic is happening it's not as if other disasters have taken a break Yeah. Uh, so you can put a city or a neighbor under lockdown but you don't lock down a cyclone you don't lock down a flood so how do you do disaster risk, risk management particularly di- disaster response where uh, you know in the background you have a pandemic and you have other hazards uh, striking so when you deploy your uh, colleagues from national disaster response force uh, this is perhaps the first time that they are not just responding they also have to protect themselves from the the virus itself so they are at risk so how do you adjust your protocols your standard operating procedures to to rise to this new challenge so i think that's there and of course in the background also is the uh already observed and becoming more severe impacts of climate related disasters so preparing for that you know how do we sort of deal with prepare our cities for urban floods how do we prepare uh, for 
uh, more intense events of rainfall, extreme rainfall, uh, perhaps more frequent uh, cyclones. Uh, last year, we had three cyclones that made landfall in India. The average is about two. I'm not saying that just on the basis of one year, we can uh, establish a trend, uh, but it it could happen. So, so I think there is a past is no longer a good guide for the future. So getting ready for uh, an increasingly uncertain future, uh, future, I mean, risky, but also uncertain future is a priority. Thank you so much, Kamal, for, for, for all this information. Um, but disaster management in these 30 years, the, the reality in the ground from a, a government perspective, and especially um, in such a huge country with so many states um, like, like, like India and, and uh, many, uh, many realities. Um, that was really, really um, insightful and, uh, and precious. To close this interview, I would like to ask two more personal questions to you. Uh, you, you told us at the beginning how you were an, an, a student in architecture and then the earthquake happened in, in, and you just went to, to, to help, to support, to, to rebuild um, a village there. So, um, but during all this career in disaster management, or maybe right now, um, have you ever dreamt or envisaged doing something else than disaster management? Uh, maybe art. Um, you know, I am an architect. Uh, I have some skills to sketch, uh, maybe music. Um, art and music is something that I have often fancied uh, that I could have um, done. Uh, having studied architecture, I wish I had done large architectural projects. So I have applied my architectural skills in this area, but not really done commercial architecture. But having said that, uh, and of course I miss uh, being able to do those things uh, and give them a lot of time. I can also say that in my chosen field now, Disaster Risk Management Day, I have uh, never had more than a dull week, maybe a week, maybe a <laughs> dull week, but it's always very interesting, very challenging. And after 30 years, I still consider myself a student of disaster risk management. There is so much more to learn. Uh, it helps you engage with a whole range of disciplines, different contexts, different approaches. So it's a very fulfilling line of work. Hmm. Thank you. And, and Kamal, for our students of um, Kalu Institute who are listening to you now, um, what would be, out of these 30 years of experience that you have um, and so diverse, what would be the one piece of advice you would extract and, and, and like to give them? Only piece of advice I will give is that talk to people. Talk mm -hmm. to people who are at risk. Talk to people who manage risk every day. Talk to people who are living with risk, who have been affected by disasters. There is no substitute to that. I think I can give you a reading list, uh, but you know, going out there in the field and being with the people and listening, asking questions, there is no substitute to that. And your best work will always come on the basis of insights you gain from talking to people. Thank you, Kamal. What a beautiful... Uh final words for, for our interview. Thank you so much for your time, for, for bringing all this knowledge and this passion, this commitment to disaster management. Thank you, Kamal. Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed the conversation. Emily. Thank you and all the best to your students. Thanks.